R. Campbell Thompson's Semitic Magic, Its Origins and Development. We're into the introduction, which is one of the larger introductions in my collection. Of course, the largest introduction that we have here is that black Quran in the corner. Um, well, it's common. Magic and Sorcery. Though they lay outside of religion and were forbidden arts, and all the civil civilized states of antiquity were yet never regarded as mere imposture. The difficulty lies in distinguishing magic from religion, and we can best quote the broad definition laid down by Robertson Smith, that the difference between religion and magic is that, while the former is the worship for the good of the community, magic is the supernatural relation for the individual. Well, it's not quite like that, but uh, when the priestcraft rulers are threatened, they say magic, magic. But seher is a different term, a little more specific than, um, but in the West, that's definitely how it was used. When it is remembered how great an influence the principle of atonement has in the Levitical laws, and yet, on the other hand, that a Babylonian sorcerer will conjure a demon forth from a sick man with a little doe figure, just as though he were a vindictive wizard of the Middle Ages, using the same self-word as the Hebrews as the name of his exorcism, the difficulty will at once be apparent. We have therefore to examine much more than the mere spell of an Arab sheikh, or a lovesick Badawi, or the amulet of some Syrian wise woman against the evil eye, the principles of which underlie wizardry go deep into the roots of religion itself, and for this region, and for this reason, if for no other magic and witchcraft deserve to be considered as something more than the impotent trickery of charlatans. Robertson Smith did that definition of for the individual in religion of the Semites. Martin de Rio in his Disquisitions S. Magica of 1599 defined magic as, okay, let's ut siet ars siu fecultus vi creta et non supernaturali quadum mira insolita efficiens quorum ratio sensum Communem hominem captum superat. Um, okay, I'm not going to translate that too well, but we are talking about a willingness to create um, and a willingness to um, change the, the mental and the sensual faculties. Something about the human. I don't... Uh, okay, uh, whatever. Um, perhaps someone in the comment can render that better. I'm rusty with my Latin. On the beliefs of magic current in the Middle Ages, the curious will find an exhaustive account in Horst's Zarber Bibliothek, and it is refreshing to read, even in a book published as late as 1898, the book of sacred magic of Apermelon the Sage, Mathers, you know, from the Golden Dawn, the remarks which are written by the editor, who apparently expects to be taken seriously, his explanatory introduction is intended purely and solely as a help to the genuine occult students, and ends with his defiance that, for the opinion of the ordinary literary critic, who neither understands nor believes in occultism, I care nothing. As religious principles develop themselves among primitive savages, Men begin to learn something of the mysterious natural forces which would enable one tribal wizard to pit himself in ghostly combat against the warlock of another clan and defeat him by his superior magic. When Elijah, priest of Yahweh, challenges the priest of Baal to a test of comparison between his god and theirs, he is only doing what medicine men of different savage tribes always do. And in this intertribal warfare of witch doctors, we can see how different classes arose between those who brought in spiritual matters. First Kings 18, 
Pharaoh's magicians cast their wands, which became serpents, and are finally swallowed by Aaron's serpent in the witch doctor's combat before the king of Egypt, Maori, la magia et la astrologi, explains. By a trick, the magicians have of throwing a viper into a kind of trance through compressing its head and making it appear as a rod. And one of the meanings behind the term seher is um, a trick. He quotes also the pavi sur les hervis revue des dukes mon des el fidawi oh, quoted in George Sale's Quran comment. I, I haven't read out that comment as part of something on my channel, but um, says that these magicians imposed on the bystanders with pieces of rope and wood that they made to writhe like serpents. Other instances, other instances in the Old Testament magic are contained in, in Exodus 15, 25, where the waters of Mara are made sweet by the casting in a tree R, where the striking of the rock causes water to flow. And First, the priest, who was the head of the profession, and after him a successive line of magic workers in grades of decreasing power, until we arrive at the bottom rung of the ladder. The witch, whose business it is to cast spells, or make love, philtries, or diet drinks of herbs, for a miserable price. Then, when the existence of this lower order of sorcerers is fully established, and accredited, to who the credulous or malicious poor will resort for aid and subterfuge. It behooves the priestly caste to set aside, uh, to set about defeating the, the machinations of such foes to law and order. For these lesser magicians, being able to invoke the powers of darkness, cause much of the tribal debt, much of the tribal debit to the priest to find its way by legal channel, by illegal channels into their own pockets, and it is such upstart rivals who impoverish the temple. From this arise many of the decrees against sorcerers who have dared to set themselves in opposition to the established castes. Now, the ancient Egyptians and other groups talked of things like this, you know, using a term like seher in the Arabic or in the Egyptian, which also has the seher, um, which is a more internal type were more real. You're dealing with the jinn. You're dealing with these fire beings, these other beings of agency. The men of old never trusted the power of the sorcerer merely because he was of low degree. To them, he was quite capable of laying a spell as the priest was of removing it. Hence, we find that although mere conjuring is today reckoned the lowest depths to which magic can descend, one of the most blatant tricks possible is described in the Assyrian legend of creation itself. The gods assemble to praise Marduk in chorus. Then they set in their midst a garment. And unto Marduk, their firstborn, they spake, May thy fate, O Lord, be a supreme among the gods to destroy or create. Speak thou the word, and shall be fulfilled. Command now, and let the garment vanish. And speak the word again, and let the garment reappear. Then he spake with his mouth, and the garment vanished. And then he commanded it, and the garment reappeared. In no wise more advanced is the story of the rod becoming a serpent in Exodus 4. And Islamic tradition relates that Abraham himself was able to work similar feats when he cut the birds into pieces in a sacrifice. An eagle, or dove as some say, a peacock, a raven, and a cock. You know, a chicken. He retained only their heads whole and mixed the flesh and feathers, laying them in four parts on four mountains. Then we called to each by name, they rejoined themselves in their first shapes to their heads. And this Marduk bit kind of remind you see kind of what Christianity is. Abraham left. It said that Abraham left in a year 
when this stuff was going on with Mar uh, when, when Marduk was becoming a usurper, uh, firstborn of God sort of figure, uh, well, of the gods, whatever, uh, different mythologies a little bit. Um, well, Bonneth, uh, you know, you did have it narrowed down in some versions. It's not, it's not just one. Um, but anyways, uh, let's... So it's, it's interesting the Abrahamic faith was, rebel, uh, was rebelling against something, uh, something that Christianity later took on, became itself. So even in the creation of man, in the Jehovah's account, man is first fashioned from clay, a story expounded by Arab tradition which relates that the angel of death took black, red, and white earth to God for man, and for this reason, men are of different colors. And let me... There's quite a difference between Arab legend and Islamic legend. Now, something is attributed to Muhammad, or his companions, or, or, or the Ahabait are passing it on, which they're bas basically they're saying, I learned from this, I, I learned from, you know, the Siplic succession back to the Prophet. Um, so it's a little bit different than the Bible, which comes from various sources, and you don't know what was attributed to Revelation or not. It's been separated from that much of it. Gabriel, Michael, and Israfil were sent by God, one after another, to fetch seven handfuls of earth to create Adam. Quran, Surah 2? It doesn't say that in Surah 2. Perhaps a comment on Surah 2, or a narration that's been connected to that. According to Barassus, the Babylonian tradition, maintained that man was made from the blood of Bel mixed with earth, and the fragment of cuneiform tablet identified by Mr. King, Seven Tablets of Creation 88, recounts that Marduk announces his intention of forming man from blood and fashioning bone. In the same way, in the Gilgamesh epic, 1, 2, 50, 33, okay, Aruru, forms a man of a new inner heart. She washes her hands, needs a piece of clay, and thus creates Eabani. Eabani, okay. Eabani. In this method of changing one's material to something more valuable, we may see the prototype of that goal of every wizard in the Middle Ages, the Philosopher's Stone. Even the Syriac story, Brooks' Assyrian, Assyriac Fragment, we find it told if one Isaac, who had appointed to Karhe, and there entertained a strange monk. This monk, on leaving, told Isaac to bring him a piece of lead, and having melted it, he took an elixir from a little wallet and poured it thereon, and it changed its color and became gold. Now, yesterday... I was digging, and I struck what looked like gold from that direction, but it turns out there was something yellow with the stone and mica, and it just reflected just right, that it gave sort of a golden color, and I was like, oh, I gotta be careful, and, uh, you know. Oh, who knows, I could find something like that, but I'm not gonna post on the internet if I do find something like that, but there, there was mica and some other stuff I don't know what the yellow stone was. Perhaps there was sulfur in there. Um, still more puerile are the trivial performances of conjurers related in later in later Jewish tradition. R. Ashi says that he saw a man scatter strips of silk from his nose, and R. Hadi has told the story of a rider of a camel who cut off the head of a camel with a sword and therefore rang a bell and the camel stood up. Our Hia answers, did you see after it stood up that the pieces were dirty for blood and dust? There was nothing, hence it was only a dazzling of the eyes. And I guess this is where we're going to stop off for 